Well, we are coming off another very hot summer here in Phoenix. I'm Chief Meteorologist Amber Sullins. And of course, as the heat continues to build over the valley summer after summer, the big topic of discussion becomes the urban heat island effect and how much that's playing into changing our temperatures here in the Phoenix metro area. Joining me today from the Arizona State University is Matei Georgescu. Matei, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Very yeah, much. We, we are so glad that you're here. We know that you've published a lot of research research uh, on what is happening with our urban heat island over the years, especially with your colleague, Mohammed Mustawi, um, who's no longer with us. Um, but he was a co-author on this most recent paper as well. And um, some, some very interesting findings coming out of this paper, which we'll get to on the urban heat island effect. But now that I have you here, I just want to start off with us having a discussion about what the urban heat island effect is and what it isn't and how it impacts our temperatures and our life here in the city, because this is really your area of expertise. Sure, yes, thank you. That's a great question, great starting point. The urban heat island can be best explained as an additional layering of heat. So it's simply warmer over cities compared to their rural or less developed, less urbanized counterparts. Then okay. the question is why? Why does why? that happen? Yeah, exactly. So tell the viewers at home who don't know why, why it makes things hotter. So the reason is because as we're changing the natural landscapes, it could be semi-desert uh, areas or it could be uh, grassland if you're in other parts of the country or of the world. Uh, you're putting over a layer of substance and layer of material that is both darker and so absorbs heat more readily, mm -hmm. keeps that heat and then emits it, re-radiates it in the evening and nighttime hours, therefore providing an extra source of heating. That's the direct effect, but there's more to the urban heat island than just the material itself. Yes, but as Phoenix expands, we're using more of those materials, right? And so we're seeing a difference in the early evening and overnight hours. If you're out in the middle of the desert, as soon as, you know, you can have a really sweltering day, but as soon as the sun goes down, it cools off fairly rapidly in that dry air desert environment. Absolutely. There's been observational measurements that have been conducted at ASU and other locations that have quantified a difference of 10, 15 degrees Fahrenheit difference between uh, the central locations in Phoenix and non-urban locations. And That's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. But now this new paper that you published um, with your colleague has shown that there's another variable in all of this that really hasn't previously been considered. And that's thermal advection. And that's thermal advection. So before we describe what that means, we have to first ask what is advection? Yeah. So advection is just the transport of some quantity. In this case, that quantity that we're interested in is, is heat. Yeah. And so we looked at Sky Harbor and the general area around Sky Harbor, the airport, and that area hasn't undergone much urban development in the last few years or a few decades. Right. Yet, if you look at the temperature readings at Sky Harbor, it's been going up and up and up. It's been a relentless path towards yeah. warming, and that's not shocking or surprising to anybody. And so the question is, why is that happening? And what we find here through both observational analysis and some of our uh, physics-based modeling approaches, it's that development, urban development upstream or northwestern and western valley, you've got those areas that are becoming warmer. And then the background wind, which is westerly, transports uh, atmosphere from west to east, is bringing that warmer air over the rest of the valley. Yeah. And so heat advection playing a, a very important role in driving the relentless warming that warming we're at Sky Harbor. Yes. So in other words, it's not Sky Harbor's fault. It's not Sky <laughs> so, Harbor's fault. You know, it's, year after no. year, I you know, there's so many Sky Harbor haters like move the thermometer, move the thermometer. We shouldn't be taking measurements there. But what your new research shows is that it is not a case of things are getting warmer at Sky Harbor because the airport is expanding or the immediate area around Sky Harbor is expanding. But in other words, the West and Northwest Valley, which historically was ag land and open desert, is now completely paved over with houses and buildings and businesses. And those areas are staying hotter. And then the winds are bringing that hot air into central Phoenix overnight. That's right. And I think you hit it right on the money when you when you uh, characterize the land use, land cover change from ag land to urban. That's pretty much the, the maximum effect that you can have. Right. A parcel of land that's irrigated, 
and that's cooler as a result of that water is now being converted to something that is absorbing solar radiation, warming up, releasing it at, at night, and then being transported. So is Sky Harbor uh, on maybe the central corridor there kind of the stopping point? Because we know we have a diurnal wind shift overnight. And for those at home, that means that over the course of a 24-hour period, we're changing the wind direction in the valley. And it's pretty consistent unless we have storm systems coming in. Usually during the day, we have a flow out of the west and southwest. And then overnight, we get the cold air sinking down from the mountains to the east and northeast. And every day, like clockwork, we see this wind shift. So by the time we wake up the next morning, the predominant wind flow is east northeast and then it shifts again west southwest in the afternoon so do those easterly and northeasterly winds take over in time to kind of save places like mesa chandler and tempe from getting as hot so this spreads throughout the metropolitan area with the effects being diminished further downstream but i want to highlight or emphasize why we looked at sky, sky harbor in particular why not at other locations it's got the longest most continuous record that yeah. we have that is available. Well, and that brings up another point of why, um, from a meteorological and climatological perspective, it's not wise to change the location of your historic observing sites across the country. Absolutely. And you mentioned before about, should we be asking questions related to the, the sighting of the thermometer? How close should it be to the airport? And how close is it to where the aircraft are actually landing? And we've We've asked that question also. We think that there's some warming associated with that, but clearly not nearly as large. It's what we would call as second or third order effect, second decimal point, third decimal yeah. point. The primary influence is, is clearly urban development here. Yeah. Um, so the other question I get asked a lot when we're talking about how much Phoenix has warmed over the last several decades is how much of this can be attributed to greenhouse gases and human induced warming and how much is attributable to our building and our paving of land. And in other words, the urban heat island effect. Is there a way to quantify if we have, you know, let's say a five degree increase over a 30 year period, how much of that is greenhouse gases how much of that is the urban heat island here in phoenix yeah that's a great question there's a way to quantify it we haven't directly done it it's through the use of simulations the reason why we can't do this with observations is that if we look at the sky harbor record all we have is a temperature reading we don't know to what that temperature reading is due to so what we did in our modeling is we can alter the land surface. We can make a particular location transition from agriculture to urban and then rerun the simulation and then see what the effect would be in a distant location in our model, which in this case corresponds to Sky Harbor. We'd have to repeat those experiments with increasing greenhouse gases to get closer to uh, an exact value or more precise value, if not exact value. Nevertheless, we've done some work in, in this area and some ongoing work, and we feel pretty confident in saying that at least half of the warming is due to urban expansion. The question is, is it 75%, is it 50%, is it 85%? That we're not ready to answer yet. Yeah, it, it seems like it's gonna be a pretty significant piece of the puzzle because even just looking at the weather records, we do see trends on the upward side, getting warmer across the state, across the country, but it is just so much more pronounced here in Phoenix. I always tell people who ask me across the country uh, about global warming and the heat that we're seeing, I say, you know, Phoenix, we're really on the forefront of this. We are basically patient zero as far as US cities go for how heat is really changing our lives around here. And that comment is particularly relevant from the perspective of temperature. Yeah. And so take the last one of the reasons why this summer may have felt a little bit better than previous summers is because and this was by all means still an above normal summer. Yeah. If you look at the temperature records, but the last two summers were very extreme in completely different ways. Two summers ago, we had that period of one straight month of 110 yes. plus maximum, which is apt that low level of temperature maximum unheard of in yeah. the what happened last year was different it's the extension of the shoulder season es essentially our summer went all the way through october yeah so a completely different type of warming where the summer is now growing longer both at the 
initial part and also at the at the conclusion. Yeah, exactly. And you know, last summer we had 70 days at 110 or hotter, 70. Wow. So yes, wow. by comparison, everyone this year was going, woohoo, this is a great summer, but it's it's a recency bias yeah, because that right. was the most we had ever seen. Yeah. And so now this summer, which ended up being in Phoenix, the fourth hottest summer on record in terms of overall temperature felt not too bad because we just came off of the hottest summer on record. But, I, you know, this isn't normal. This is not the way that it has been around here. Or as you would say, it's way above normal. Yeah, way yeah. above normal. Yeah. The other thing that came out of this paper um, that I wanted to talk to you about is not only is uh, the overnight temperature reading at Sky Harbor becoming hotter because of we're bringing in that hot air from the Northwest Valley, like you mentioned, but you also noted in here that we're seeing a decrease in the change in temperature over a 24 hour period, say. so. And, and that goes into, uh, you know, the, the paving and the building and the concrete and all of that as well, because as we mentioned at the top of this podcast, if you're out into an open desert area and you're in a dry air environment, you see wild temperature swings between day and night. It, it goes, you know, much cooler once the sun sets. But what you're seeing now in Phoenix is not that big of a difference between the daytime high and the overnight low. And that means that we're we're not getting enough time to cool off. Exactly. So we're getting, we're going to get pretty close. I think it was last year, maybe the year before, you're, you're going to correct me now, when, when we had a minimum or a maximum minimum temperature of 97 yeah, degrees. Yeah, that's the Harbor. record warm low, 97. So with continued yeah. urban development and the right large scale situation, we're going to come upon a night within the next five or so years, maybe 10 years, where the minimum temperature will stay in the triple digits. And that's largely driven, not entirely, by urban expansion. And so what we're seeing is this continued and relentless increase in the minimum temperature, but correspondingly, the maximum temperature is not increasing at the same rate. It's increasing much slower. So the yeah. difference between the maximum and the minimum continues to they're, shrink. They're coming together. So just because we saw uh, a 97 degree low and could see a 100 degree low does not necessarily mean that our daytime highs are going to go up toward 130. Absolutely not. There's there's basic physical principles that would have to be disobeyed for right. for that. To it happen. would change everything it we would know change everything about we atmospheric know. physics. And... That's right. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. would go towards a runaway planet where we've got major concerns. Major concerns. Yeah. Is there anything else in this research that you maybe found surprising? Any conclusions that you weren't expecting in this or some of the other research you've done in the past? Or well, is this pretty much just verifying your hypothesis of what you you have seen and what you think is going on around here? There's a couple of new things here. There hasn't been much work on the role of advection in particular. Much of the work in the urban heat island literature community has been focused on the radiation aspects. Mm -hmm. So for example, materials absorb heat at greater efficiency. They release it in the evening at nighttime. The taller the buildings, the less that the surface can cool off at yeah. night. But the transport part of this hasn't really been looked at very much. There's a handful of papers. One of the second aspects coming out of this directly is because advection is such a, an important role, at least for Phoenix, we're now developing a new tool. We call it Mini Wharf. It's actually called FAZE, the Phoenix Heat Advection Simulation Engine. I've got two wonderful computer science students, uh, undergraduate Barrett Honors College at ASU, uh, uh, Omar and uh, Brendan, working on taking this very complex code into something that anybody with no background in meteorology with no background in high performance computing can take out their phone go to your laptop change a particular location to an urban area run the model it'll take you a minute or two to run the model and see what the local effects and the downstream effects of that warming would be that's cool that's going to be very helpful for for planning in the future right? absolutely yeah so what do you we haven't talked solutions yet let's do that before we wrap what do you think solutions might be for the phoenix metro area to kind of stop or at least you know slow down the overnight warming should we be building up instead of out so it depends on how you want to so building up will also increase temperatures but the increase in temperatures will be much more compact over a smaller area. over a smaller area the land surface that you're replacing is also very important so for example um there's a lot of parking lots out in the phoenix metro area yeah uh, those are just heat sinks. They're just absorbing. So those are prime locations for development. 
where parking lots should be, if not built underground, and I know that there's a financial cost and other considerations to be made, yeah. uh, but those should not be a part of our land surface because they're they're adding to this burden of to this burden of heating. Yeah. There's other issues related to public transportation. Right now, it's really not easy to get from location A to location B unless you go drive in your car. We talked about the urban heat island. That's an additional layer of heating simply because in order for me to come here, I had to drive my car. Yeah. Right. And as a result of that, I dumped extra heat into the environment. Atmosphere. Yeah. 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 Those it's all very complex, um, but that's why I'm glad that there are folks like you working on these issues to at least illuminate like why it's happening, get that information into decision makers' hands so that they can make the best decision for us moving forward. Absolutely, yeah, and we're super excited about this new tool, which we hope will be ready for some level of prime time within the next month or so. Okay, I can't wait. Yeah. All right, let me know when that happens. Absolutely. Thank you so to. much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you watching, if you have questions about what's happening, um, you can email us anytime, share at abc15.com. If you have questions about the weather, the environment, um, our urban heat island effect, we're here to uh, listen and respond. Respond. So again, share at abc15.com is the way to get a hold of us. Thank you so much.